And let's start a new notebook, new Python 3 notebook for today's class. We start, I posted in Teams the link to lesson four. And this is where the fun really start, NumPy arrays. NumPy arrays are an engineer's best friend. And um, so let's call this notebook class eight notes, as I like to do. You can choose your name, but naming your files is uh, a good habit. All right, and uh, turn that into a markdown cell to leave some notes to ourselves here, uh, class eight. Um, and we start with lesson four of EngComp one. I'm going to uh, get the short URL again, go.gwu.edu um, slash and engcomp1 lesson four. And let me paste that as a uh, little breadcrumb. There it is, uh, lesson four. And so you've come a long way now with uh, Python and Jupyter using some foundational um, programming patterns, indexing, slicing, iterations with for statements, uh, conditionals with if, else, uh, if, el, um, el, if and else, um, string methods and list methods. Um, all of this lays a foundation for us to now use some of those skills in a setting that is more of more of higher relevance for engineering settings. And um, ideally, if you've been doing the homework pr uh, uh, promptly, then you've gotten practice with these uh, foundational skills that we need to now reuse, but in the context of uh, arrays. So what is an array? Well, we know about lists and uh, the difference with an array uh, versus a list um, uh, is that um, in a list, if you recall, we have a, C, um, um, a S elements, um, ordered elements that are separated by a comma and, but they can be anything. In an array, all the elements need to be of the same type. So if you have an array of numbers, all of the elements need to be numbers. If you have an array of strings, all of the elements have to be strings. And the advantage of um, having advanced knowledge, if you will, that all of the elements have the same type makes arrays faster, more if, um, uh, faster to, to execute the operations that we um, want to uh, uh, apply on them. And that is of importance for engineering applications where often the arrays that we operate on are large. And um, so we're going to see an example where we can do something with an array or do it with a list and we're gonna time it and see that the array is more, uh, it's faster, it just, it just is more effective. Uh, efficient rather is the word I want to use. Okay, so another thing that I want to say is that you so far, um, we've been using the uh, core of Python, but I, if you recall from our first class, I said that Python as a language is a general purpose language. You can do many things with Python. You can do websites, you can do um, uh, the numerical type of computing that we do in engineering, you can do data analysis, you can do um, finance, um, data analytics of various sorts, you can send email to a bunch of people, you can uh, manipulate uh, text as we have seen so far. And so being so um, um, able to do so many things, some parts of the language are separated out into what we call libraries, specialized uh, uh, collections of functions and functionality for the language that is separated out. And that means that we need to import those libraries. And there are two 
libraries that are going to be our favorites as engineers. Um, These are NumPy uh, for uh, arrays uh, and um, and quite a bit of um, you know and not only array uh, array uh, the array the array data type but also many operations that are built in for arrays that you're going to learn you're going to learn to love them Matt plotlib is a library for two-dimensional um, um, visualizations uh, of many many sorts by two-dimensional I mean well you know you usually are not going to be doing three-dimensional plotting with matplotlib you usually do most of it is two-dimensional visualization although there are some some other opportunities let's just say let's just say for data visualization in general and keep it simple these are going to be the libraries the python libraries that we're going to learn about in this course um, and that you're going to learn to love as i say all right let me enter another cell to move that up a little bit so um, a word on importing libraries to expand your running Python session with this additional functions that are not just out of the box ready to go. And these are large collections of code and for special purposes. And because they're not loaded automatically, then we have to import using the import command. So we do import numpy and that now we have available to us when you type import numpy, all of the a array operations um, uh, that come with this wonderful library. Now we're going to learn a bunch of um, basic operations um, uh, with NumPy. And if you look at the lesson that we've written, oftentimes when we introduce a new um, um, function from, from the library NumPy, we will link out to the official documentation on the web that explains what that function does. I want to encourage you whenever you find that kind of link in our lessons to follow the link and read and explore the documentation because this is very useful for you as you learn new functions. And um, um, okay, so now we have available to us NumPy. So how do we create an array? So an array, uh, we can turn a list into an array by using NumPy dot array so if what is a list remember a list is a, a, a sequence of elements separated by commas but an array wants those elements to be of the same type so let's start with um you know uh, just integers in this case and i'm going to shift enter to execute that and i get back the same thing often we're going to want to save that into a variable but in input line number two, I did not save that to a variable by an assignment operator. I just used that command to be able to see um, the, the output of, of what the array looks like. Another function that exists to create NumPy arrays that is very useful is called numpy.ones. What's it do? It creates an array filled with the number one, <laughs> each element is the number one. And what we give it is the number of elements that we want. So for example, if I give it seven, it's going to create an array that has seven instances of the number one. Why would that be useful? Well, maybe you want to create an array of a certain size, fill it up with ones, and then change a few of the elements to match a certain um, uh, equation um, or, you want to multiply every element by a particular factor that represents a quantity that you are um, uh, evaluating in, 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 in a function or a set of data. So we use that quite a bit. Similarly, there's one numpy.zeros. When I want to use a function that is part of the NumPy library, I use the library name 
and the dot ahead of that. So array is a function that is coming from the NumPy library, is not a, a core Python uh, function. Similarly, once, if I were to use, uh, let me add a function, let me add a cell here. If I were to use just once and try to do that, I'm going to get an error because once is not defined in the standard Python um, uh, core language. But NumPy is like a set of code that expands the language, the Python language with many more functions available to you. The function once is from the NumPy library and we prepend the library name every time we use a function from, from it. Uh, so that is the reason and thank you for your question. So, Similarly, zeros is a function from the NumPy library and it creates an array of the size that I give it as an argument filled up with zeros. Like the previous one, it is a function that is helpful to create an array to start with that then I'm going to do something with. I'm going to create an array filled with zeros and then maybe I'm going to change a few of those elements following some equation. So as you can see, this is, this is already uh, a, num, a library that is aiming to give us uh, the ability to do numerical computations. Um, okay, so that's another one. And another very useful one is called a range. So let me create here a markdown cell to introduce you to the function a range numpy um let me use uh, a range so what does that do it creates an evenly space uh, or an array let's say of evenly spaced values defined in an interval. So how does it work? The syntax is going to be numpy.a range and the arguments I need to give it are a start number, a, a stop number and a step. Start, stop, step. The step is um, um, optional and the default is one. So if you don't give it a step, the final argument, then it's going to assume that you just want to step by one. And the stop is not inclusive. So if I, if that's something to remember, it's a typical pattern in Python that we give a range of numbers like we do in slicing and the upper value is not included. So let's do, let's try it. Let's try an example. If, what if I try uh, numpy.a range and I just give it one number? Well, what uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that I'm going to uh, assume that the step is one. I'm going to, uh, something I didn't say here is that if I don't give it the start, that is assumed to be zero. So if I'm only going to give it one value, I assume that start is zero, step is one, and then st stop is the only one that's left. So this is going to create a NumPy array starting at zero, ending at four, but not including four and stepping by one. So there it is, zero, one, two, three. So it has four elements. 
The four indicates that, but Python always starts at zero if I don't give it an alternative. And so that is why uh, that is the output that I get. The way that that is being printed out is uh, representing that if you had something in square brackets, you would assume it to be a list. If I do array round brackets around that, it is assumed that that list is converted to an array. Uh, but this is just the display of uh, an information of the data type that is um, an array. So let me add actually just, let me do here an assignment to make it look a little bit different. So let me assign to the name X, the result of numpy dot a range and let me give it now say two comma seven. So what's that going to do? It's going to start at two, end at seven, but not including seven and step by one. If I execute that, I don't see any output because the important thing that happened here was the assignment. But now I have a variable created, a variable X. And if I do type X, it's now telling me that is a NumPy ND array. ND starts for N dimensional because we're now working with one dimensional arrays, which are like vectors, if you can imagine, but we can also do two dimensional arrays and three dimensional arrays, and we're gonna learn about them uh, in this uh, lesson as well. So we created a variable here, and that is of type array. But if I print X, then I see again, array, it's an array, and the values of the array are two, three, four, five, six. So if I were to type numpy.a range, and I say, but in steps of two, then you would see that y is now skipping two. So we have um, uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, 11. Uh, the 12 is not included, of course. And if I had given a 13 there, uh, it is also not included um, because we're stepping by two and um, 11 plus two is 13, but the end is not included. NumPy.array. So now we see I'm starting at zero, ending at five, and uh, I'm stepping by 0 0.5. You can have any number here, 0 0.1, and now you get a very big array because I'm stepping with small numbers. Notice that the last element is 4.9, because five is not inclusive. This is something to always keep reminding yourself of until you're comfortable with it uh, because it can be sources of, of bugs in the beginning. All right, uh, NumPy arrays. So they're very useful. And now that we have an array, uh, let's say we have Y, right? So let's use Y. Uh, now that we have arrays, we have uh, the opportunity to operate on those arrays using NumPy operations. So I could, for example, uh, do a different array, call it sum x, y, and uh, that's going to be x plus y. Let's see if those are the same uh, length, otherwise I get an error. Uh, okay, so they could not be broadcast together because one has five elements, the other one has six elements. So let's change that. Um, to, so that our example works and just, just go to something that has the same size to be able to add them. Otherwise, uh, I get an error. So I have added two arrays here. And if I now look at sum x, y, this array is the direct um, uh, element by element addition of the two arrays, which is similar to what you would do if you add two vectors, right? If you have two vectors, then the addition is um, in every component, you, you add uh, the, the, the contributions of each, of each vector. So this is very useful for many applications in engineering. In addition to adding two arrays, we can also apply other types of operations. For example, I could, um, uh, well, take the square root uh, of an array, take the square of an array. So I could do numpy.square, S-Q-R-T for square root. And let's take the square root of Y. 
and I get uh, the square root of each element in the original array. Or I could do the, um, well, I could do multiplication of two arrays as well, and that multiplies element by element. If I multiply an array by itself, it would be the same as taking the square. Let's see if that works. And there you go. You can take powers of arrays and it will take the power of each individual element in the array. And this is quite useful. I mean, if you are familiar with another language like uh, C, for example, if you want to do an operation like this, you would need a for loop and you have to step through every element. And here you just do it in one line. So that's very useful uh, for our type of applications. All right, so that is the basic of the arrays, but let me show you now two dimensional arrays. We can create an array of any dimension with NumPy. A two-dimensional array would be like a nested, an array of arrays, if you will. So for example, if I, and an array would be equivalent of a matrix. If I wanted to create an array in two-dimensional, in two dimensions, let's do it and create, I'm going to call it big A, and I'm going to create a numpy dot array. And instead of giving it just one list, I'm going to give it a list of lists. So I'm going to uh, enter some spaces so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm just going to create that template. There's a list of lists, right? And in each list, I'm going to add the elements. And the observation we need here is that these are created row wise. So if I now print A, you will see the first row is one, two, the second row is three, four, and it's shown nicely to me arranged in that way so I can see what's happening. And similarly to one dimensional arrays, two dimensional arrays can be added, subtracted or multiplied. So if I now assign, I have assigned that to A, if I assign B, suppose I create B as a numpy dot, array. Again, for clarity, I'm going to create my first list and then inside create the structure, two sub lists, and then I'm going to add the values. So let me add one comma minus one. And in the second sub list, I'm going to put zero comma one, execute that the period instead of a and it's giving me a warning about ragged nested sequences, which is, means that they're not well, uh, I suppose, well uh, structured. Okay, thank you so much. It was a period instead of a comma. And um, that shows you why pair programming works because sometimes it's right in front of you and you don't see it, but another pair of eyes will see your mistake. So now I can add these two arrays naturally in one line, A plus B gives me the sum element wise. I could multiply them a, a times B. And let's check, is that an element wise, element wise multiplication? So one times one, yes, that's there. Two times minus one, yes. Three times zero, zero and four times one, four. So it's an element wise multiplication. If I wanted to do proper matrix multiplication instead of element-wise multiplication, I can do that too. And that is built in with the at binary operator. So using the at symbol, I will get matrix multiplication. So A with the at instead of the asterisk, I'm going to get the matrix multiplication that you know from um, basic linear algebra. <laughs> All right, um, this is where it really starts getting fun. But let's create a 3D array now because you know that's, that's 2D, it's a matrix, a 3D now, that's called a tensor. And it's much harder to visualize, but they're also quite useful. And um, we can create, I'm gonna, 
make this a markdown cell to make this a heading because this is now important for 3D arrays and to highlight 3D arrays here. So we can create a 3D array by reshaping a 1D array and putting like rows uh, one after stacking the, the, uh, the elements uh, in rows. We can use numpy.reshape. And what is the, um, the variables? The variables are an array that we want to reshape and the new shape that we want to give it. And the shape has to be um, uh, indicate um, the number of uh, the number of elements in each dimension. So, for example, uh, let's try using numpy dot a range, and we're going to make sure this has uh, twenty four elements. And if I don't give it any other arguments, it starts at zero and steps by one. So this is going to go from zero, one, two, three, four, until twenty three because twenty four is not included. There we have it. So if I do len a, it also works by the way, len as a function works on arrays, just like it did in lists and, and so on. And okay, we have 24 elements from zero until 23. Let's move, turn this into a 3D version of itself by using numpy.reshape. And uh, what do we want to reshape? The array a. How do I want to reshape it? Well, let's give it dimensions and the dimensions are going to be it's given in parentheses. Let me give it two by three by four. Mind you, this has to match the number of arrays uh, elements that I have available. And let's here just add one line to print a uh, 3D and execute that. Okay, let's see, what are we looking at? That is a little bit complicated. Okay, zero, one, two, three is the first row of the first matrix, because if you notice here, I have three levels of nested uh, square brackets. And um, what we have is that the first element is a matrix. That matrix has um, um, three rows, with four columns and the two matrices have the same thing. So to visualize this is a little bit difficult. And so we have an illustration that I want to show you that is helps quite a bit to figure out what is going on here. Let me scroll down to 3D arrays and here is the illustration. Have a look at that. So that has the same values. Uh, let me pop here back zero, one, two, three, the first row of the first matrix. What is that here? Zero, one, two, three is the first row of the face matrix. So the first dimension of the array, when I created it, the first dimension, that two there, gives me the number of sub matrices. The second dimension gave me the number of rows of each matrix. And that is given by what we called it X, Y, and Z. In X, we have just one and two um, mat uh, sub matrices. In um, uh, the Y direction, we have three rows. And in the Z direction, we have four columns. So this is a it's very hard to visualize things in 3D, of course. So this is one way that we can imagine uh, a three-dimensional array where um, in the first dimension we have matrices, uh, two matrices here kind of stacked together. Um, each, uh, so uh, why is this visualization important to study and look at and think about? Because we can do slicing of arrays just like you've done in lists. And if you recall, when we had a nested list, we had two slides there um, uh, in two dimensions. And the same thing happens with arrays. We have to slice um, um, in multi dimensions. So, if, so let's, let's do some slicing. We had an array that was called A. 
there it is. Let me, oh, by the way, if I do print A, uh, it looks a little bit different. I don't see that array indication. I just see the, the, the output. So that is a, um, a, a two-dimensional array. So if I wanted to grab the element on the first row and first column, I can use slicing with two indices, A, square brackets, first row is zero index, first column is zero index, and out comes the number one, which was the number here in the first row, first column. Let me give you an exercise now just for a moment. And this one, uh, it says X array, but let's do it with the A array that we created just now. They make that larger so you see it. And so for, and let me just give you I have a new soft toy and this soft toy is a timer. And let me just give you, that's two minutes. The next thing is the colon. Um, we have learned to use the colon in slicing uh, before, but let's now see what happens if we use it in this uh, two-dimensional array. For example, I could grab the first column by saying, okay, I want of the array A. Colon means all the elements um, of uh, every row and the zero indicates the first column. So now I see array one, three, which is the first column, if you can see from above. And um, if I want the first row, then A square bracket, the um, first row is indicated by the index zero. And for the second index, I'm gonna use colon to indicate all of them. So shift enter to execute and you see out comes the first row. Now, what can we do um, for a 3D array now? Practice with a three-dimensional array. So we have, uh, we called it A3D. I'm going to print it again to see it. Um, it was called A3D. Let's see, there it is. So now I have this three-dimensional array. So if I want to use slicing with a three-dimensional array, I need three indices. So suppose that I want to get the, um, so now I'm going to try to get um, the first column of both submatrices. Let's call them submatrices. Uh, that would be A, little a, 3D, and I need three indices. And so, um, both submatrices, so, so all of the submatrices, uh, all the rows and the first column. So let's check uh, the first column of both submatrices. Let's see, first submatrix sub has zero, four, eight as the first column, there it is, zero, four, eight. The second submatrix has 12, 16, 20, 12, 16, 20. Those are the first column of each of the two submatrices. The first index here indicates the submatrices with the column, we said all of them. The second index here indicates the rows with the column, we say all of them. And the final one indicates the column that we want, the first column in each case. And um, okay, so what we can get some uh, smaller bits of our array using uh, a, a slice in the index. So for example, if we want the, um, the first two elements uh, of the first column of both matrices. So the array name is A3D and I'm saying, well, both sub matrices. So my first index is colon indicating all of them. 
the second index, okay, the second index I want. Um, uh, so the last index, I know it says the first column, so that's going to be zero, but the index in the middle is the one that I need to figure out. The index in the middle says the first two elements. So we're going from zero to two. And now we've used a colon in there to indicate a range of indices. Let's shift enter to execute there and have a look. Both side matrices, the first two elements of the first column, Let's see, 0, 4, 12, 16. So that allowed us to get a more complicated slice out of the array. Um, and here it is where things get interesting, slicing into multidimensional arrays. And really, the only way to get comfortable with this is by practicing quite a bit and seeing if you can work it out in your head and then typing the index uh, uh, that you expect to work, see the output, compare with what uh, you expect it to see, and correct it, uh, if you get it wrong. I'm going to, of this array, I want to get uh, from both submatrices, so that's all of the submatrices, and how uh, the, this index indicates the rows. So. Uh, if I want to get the rows, so did you say the first two rows? Zero, two, two. And then what columns do we want? All the columns, all the, uh, uh, and here's the first two rows of matrix one and the first two rows of matrix two. If I just wanted the first two rows of the first matrix, for example, I would, instead of using a colon there, I would use a zero to indicate the first sub matrix. Let me show you the exercise and the um, this time I'm going to here's the exercise this time I'm going to start the timer and I'm going to give it three minutes not four minutes because this is a little bit more work four minutes the next thing that we're going to do and as, as it's shown right here uh, in this continuation of the of the lesson uh, is to compare to 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 um, give you evidence of that statement I made earlier in the class that NumPy arrays are going to be uh, faster than doing the same equivalent operation in a list. So um, let's tr let's let's try that now. So um, num uh, this is actually a note that I'm going to leave leave in this markdown cell and. Um, NumPy versus list, uh, NumPy arrays versus, versus lists in uh, an, an operation, um, typical operation, maybe adding two arrays versus adding the element in a list that contains numbers. Of course, we can do that with lists. Now, with lists, we would have to do a for loop. So already NumPy array uh, NumPy, the NumPy library makes our life easier because I can add two arrays in one line of code, x plus y, that's it. Whereas for a list, I have to write a for loop and access every element one by one. Uh, but the, that's one already advantage. But the advantage I want to discuss now is the, um, the uh, performance benefit of using NumPy arrays when you do uh, operations. So let's create an element wise sum for a list. So let's do let's let, let's do that. Element wise sum of uh, the elements of a list. How do we do that? Well, we're going to have to write let's create a big list. Let's suppose we have 100 elements in the list and um, I'm going to create a, a random elements. To create random elements, I'm going to take advantage of another library in Python, which is called random. So I'm going to import a library called random. And this uh, gives me um, um, a set of operations for random numbers. And um, uh, several, several functions to get random numbers. And so I'm going to create a list Let's call it list under dash one. 
And this list is going to, and now here I'm going to use random, the random library, and I'm going to use the sample function that it needs to, uh, the following, the, it's going to take a um, numbers. So I'm going to use here the range function to create the uh, where I want to sample from and 100 of those samples. That's one list. The other list I can do the same way, but because it's random, they're going to have different values. And maybe just to see what is in there, we're going to print um, the first um, 10, why not, elements of list one. And here I see that there are numbers like we expected between zero and, well, we get uh, there between zero and 100, but we don't get higher than 76 here. And that's just the first 10 numbers of this list. So now we need to write a for statement and we need to append the results of the element y sum into a new list. And we're going to call that result. We usually have this, um, res uh, this, this method where we create a empty list and then we can use a for uh, loop and we're gonna uh, iterate for i in range 100. And what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to, in the result list, append, um, well, I need to add list one, whoops, uh, plus uh, list one, the element at position I, plus list two and element at position I. Okay, so I'm adding uh, the element-wise uh, contributions of the two lists here, one by one, uh, going through the whole number of elements in the both lists and appending uh, that to the list of results. That creates a list of the same size as list one and list two, where each element is the sum of the two corresponding elements of the original list. So that would do what I want to do. But in addition, I'm going to add a new line here. This line is a built in, it's called a magic, a cell magic, uh, with two percents and the keyword time. And this is called a cell magic. This particular cell magic gives me the time to execute all the contents, all the code contents in this cell. Let me execute that unless I have any errors. I have a result that tells me um, uh, CPU times, um, blah, 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 and then wall time. And so that is an indication of the um, time that it took uh, to execute that operation with lists. So now let's see what happens if I have two arrays of 100 random elements. So let's create now um, array one, and we're going to use a NumPy function that allows you to create random numbers. And it's, I'm gonna, it's called rand, rand for random, R-A-N-D, I-N-T for integer. And this function has the following syntax. I give it a starting point, the ending point, and the size. How many elements do I want? A hundred elements from zero to a hundred and make them random. Array two, I can create it with the same line of code, but it's going to be different because of course these are random numbers, random integers from zero to 100 and give me a hundred of them. If I don't have any errors that created two arrays of 100 
um, random integers between zero and 100. So now we can use the time cell magic again to time the results of adding those two arrays using NumPy uh, element-wise su summation of those two arrays. So let's do two percenters, two percent uh, uh, characters and the keyword time. And underneath we're going to simply do, well, hmm, Let's try numpy.random.randint. Let's see if this one works. I get a pane down below in the Jupyter Notebook with the manual page for this function randint, which creates a, a sequence of a, a random integer numbers. And it's telling me here that uh, the uh, arguments that this function needs are one integer, which is the lowest integer to be drawn from. That's the first uh, required argument. Uh, there's a, a high, um, which is optional, and that we've given it here is 100. And then there's a size also that is a parameter that can indicate, if I scroll down, it says um, the um, the output shape, and um, um, if I give it only one value, it's just going to be the length of that array. I could give it a shape. I could create an array with a different, uh, you know, I could create a two-dimensional array by giving it, for example, parentheses 100, comma 100, but I just want a one-dimensional array in this case. So always you should uh, make sure to read and explore the manual page of every new function that we introduce in class and that is introduced in the written lessons, either by using the question mark and the function name inside the Jupyter Notebook or simply Google with the function name and you will end up, if you Google you know, numpy.random.randint, you probably end up in the NumPy official documentation website with the same content. So that is the way that this function um, works. We give it uh, the size of the array that we want, the beginning and the end of the numbers in the range that we want, and it's going to create random integers between 0 to 100 and 100 of them in a one-dimensional array. Question mark. Uh, I'm going to delete that now. And let's do it uh, with NumPy. I'm going to call it a result now, and that result is, well, already it's easier to write array one plus array two than it was to write a for loop, obviously. But if I shift enter to execute, I will notice that the time it took to add two arrays, NumPy arrays, is quite a bit less than the time it took to add element-wise uh, two lists. Now, you may think, well, between 24 microseconds and 34 microseconds, I don't care because I don't, you know, I said microseconds, I don't see it, right? In terms of human time, that is invisible to me. But if instead I were doing, if instead of 100 elements, I were doing 1,000 or 10,000, and you should try it, then the difference might be more, more, more important. And once you're doing large computations, which is typical in engineering applications, this difference in performance matters quite a bit. It can make the difference between getting the result, you know, in a few minutes or uh, having to go and get a coffee and come back two hours later to get the result. So that is why we prefer NumPy arrays. Let me pause for a moment and see if there's any questions. All right, so your timing results, of course, might be different than the timings I'm getting because I'm using, you know, we're different, different, using different computers, but hopefully you see the same pattern, which is that always the arrays are faster to add than element-wise uh, to lists. So that is uh, the little lesson here. And um, you should try some bigger numbers. You should certainly try this after we finish the class and before you close your Jupyter Notebook, try some bigger numbers and see what, um, uh, what you get. 
Um, okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is to learn to use matplotlib to plot. Uh, we have only two minutes, but um, uh, let me teach you before that some new function that we're going to new function, new NumPy array, NumPy array function that is very useful that we're going to use uh, when plotting ne next class. And this is um, LinSpace, a very useful NumPy function. LinSpace, so let's write it numpy.linspace to be very explicit of the fact that this function comes from the num NumPy library. And the syntax for this is um, uh, we create it. I don't know if you, we probably haven't used it. No, I, ha I didn't introduce this yet. So it's going to give me a set of uh, evenly spaced numbers between two uh, limits. So suppose I give it zero and two, and what I give it is the number. So suppose I give it forty-one. That's the number of elements. And uh, well, this is just a demonstration. So I'm going to actually write this in the in the cell below and change that without the back tick. And here is the output. So what we have is a uh, start, end, and the number of, let's type explicitly, the number of elements that I want in the array. And as you can see here, we start at zero, we end at two, and we include 41 numbers. So if I were to do len of numpy.lin space, just as a sanity check, zero comma two comma 41, it tells me it's 41. So the number of elements matches what I give it here as the last argument. Um, unlike many of the other functions in Python, in this case, the end value is included. As you can see here, the two is included. The reason for this is to make this function work the same way as it works in MATLAB, because this uh, many people that use MATLAB are used to this function uh, working in this way. So they made it to match the behavior of MATLAB. But it means that you have to remember that LinSpace behaves just a little bit different that is uh, the case in many of the other Python functions. And since we uh, now reached the uh, end of our class time, um, I'm going to invite you to stay and ask any questions, stay in the Zoom call. I'm gonna stay a few more minutes, but if you need to leave, you. Uh, should feel free to drop off.